Good afternoon, good evening everyone, depending on where in the world you are. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're going to hear this afternoon from Professor Trevor Sharp. Uh, Trevor is Eunice Radcliffe Medical Fellow in Neuroscience and Professor of Neuropharmacology. And his talk this afternoon has got to be one of the sexiest titles that we have come across. Psychiatry goes psychedelic. Trevor is going to talk for about 30 minutes and we'll then do a Q&A for about 15 minutes. Please, as he goes along, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and I will endeavor to ask as many of them as I can uh, during uh, the Q&A. So Trevor, over to you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Valerie, for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody, to this presentation. Thanks for coming along. It's really a, um, a pleasure, indeed an honor, to be uh, contributing to UNIV's celebration of its 775 uh, anniversary through uh, giving this, uh, this talk this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to get my presentation going. I hope this is my first slide, and I thought that I would sort of enter into the spirit of the occasion and give you all a mild psychedelic experience. I should say, um, I have to confess that I've never had the, uh, the courage nor the curiosity to um, test the effects of a psychedelic drug on myself, and it may well be that one or two of you who are listening in this evening um, have a bit of an advantage over me in that regards. Just a little bit more about, about myself. I'm a neuropharmacologist, as Valerie mentioned, and uh, throughout my career, I've had um, a special research interest in the properties of a signaling molecule in the brain called 5-HT, sometimes referred to as serotonin. And it turns out that 5-HT signaling happens to be a target of psychedelic drugs. So here's a little bit of evidence that psychiatry is indeed going psychedelic. I, I did this uh, survey of the literature just a, a few days ago, and I was searching the literature for publications um, with these uh, uh, two keywords. I'm just going to get my uh, pointer here. Uh, with these two keywords, and what you can see over time, there's this remarkable increase in the number of publications uh, in this research field. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have some uh, understanding of what's going on here. So this slide here sets out the main aims of this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna have a, a brief look at why psychiatry might need psychedelic drugs. I'm gonna have a, a look at the history of psychedelic drug research. And they're going to move on to um, briefly examining the therapeutic potential of psychedelics, have a think a little bit about how harmful these drugs are, how they might work in the brain, and then end up, I'm going to wrap up with giving you a brief perspective um, where I think psychedelic drugs might be going in terms of their development as, as therapies. So starting off with why might psychiatry need uh, psychedelic drugs, I'm just going to use a major depression as an example. So here on this part of the slide, you can see the core symptoms of major depression. I'll let you read them for yourself. And we've all experienced these sorts of symptoms as parts of the ups and downs of everyday life. Somebody who's got major depression, these sorts of symptoms and feelings are very severe and they're enduring. It's very common in the general population. Here's some data from the World Health Organization um, that documents the incidence of uh, depression uh, in different countries around the world. And at any one moment in time, there's around about 320 uh, million people who are suffering from this, uh, from this disorder. And the UK, it's around about 2 million. This is more data from the World Health Organization, and they've ranked uh, the leading causes of disability. And major depression 
is at the top of these rankings and it's been been so historically and it's predicted to be remain so um, uh, in the years ahead. So perhaps it's not surprising that there's a major uh, socio-economic cost associated with this disorder. Here are some numbers down here that are coming from the US. And here these numbers are, are reflecting not just healthcare costs, but also the costs associated with um, low product productivity, absenteeism, and also uh, costs associated with the carers. So we've got a very common, we've got a very disabling illness. The good news is that we do have treatments um, and there's much progress that has been made in this regards, but there's still uh, important challenges uh, that remain ahead. So if you look back in time, you go back to the start of the 20th century, which is really the beginnings of biological psychiatry, that patients with severe depression, they were purged, they were deeply sedated, they were uh, had comas induced, they were um, exposed to chemically evoked seizures. All this was well intended, uh, but it was very unsafe and it turns out in retrospect to be completely ineffective. And that practice uh, continued until around about the 1950s when there was a very important development and that is the discovery of the first generation of antidepressant drugs and some examples are listed here and it wasn't just antidepressant drugs that were discovered at that time but other important drugs that were useful in psychiatry were also uh, discovered around this period. Now, these drugs were discovered by pure serendipity. Very little was known about their mechanism of action. It turned out that they were effective in clinical trials and uh, they were subsequently prescribed. Their mechanism of action wasn't worked out until some years later through the work of Julius Axelrod and others. And they discovered the molecular target uh, of these agents. And one of the molecular targets turned out to be the serotonin or 5-HT reuptake. And on the basis of that discovery, a new generation of antidepressants were developed, the SSRIs, which you probably have all heard about. And the first one that came along was Prozac. And these drugs, even though they were discovered um, uh, around about 30 years ago, they're still the main line treatment for major depression, usually used in combination with counseling and other forms of psychosocial support. And there's good evidence that they're effective. However, behind the kind of the marketing gloss, these drugs do have suffer from a number of shortcomings, one of which is that they have a, a delay of onset of therapeutic effect of many weeks. And another problem with these drugs is, it's now evident that quite a lot of people don't get a satisfactory level of therapeutic effect. And it's estimated in some studies that about a third of patients turn out to be treatment resistant. Now the pharmaceutical industry, big pharma, have made major investments in the psychiatry field from the 1990s onwards have had little return, they haven't been able to make an improvement on uh, existing treatments, and have largely abandoned the field, not just in terms of treatment of depression, but other uh, forms of, of, of psychiatric illness. So we've been left in a position of having severely ill patients and uh, with few treatment options, and in the most severe cases, uh, neurosurgical approaches have been considered. So given the, 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 we've got a common and very disabling treatment, uh, illness and treatments that are, are, are less perfect than we want them to be, perhaps there's an opportunity for psychedelic drugs to come here in here as a therapeutic option. Now, it sounds a bit fanciful. I should just say that there has been one development that I ought to, to, to just indicate to you over this time, and that is the development of a molecule called ketamine. Like the psychedelics, it has very powerful effects uh, on the brain, uh, but it is approved as, uh, as an antidepressant. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the current status of ketamine at the end of the talk. So a little bit more about psychedelic drugs and the history behind their research. So just to be clear, the sorts of drugs that we're talking about here, or I'm thinking about, are examples here. So we've got LSD, We've got uh, a psilocin, which actually is the, um, um, the active uh, component of psilocybin. 
we've got dimethyltryptamine, we've got mescaline. And all of these drugs, when they're administered to, to humans, they have very powerful effects on their brain. They have strong effects on consciousness, uh, on, uh, on, on emotions and perceptions, and are also associated with strong uh, hallucinations, particularly visual hallucinations. I've also illustrated the chemical structures of these molecules, and you don't need to be a medicinal chemist to spot that there are similarities in the chemical structure of these drugs and the chemical structure of 5-HT. And that gives you some clues as to how these uh, sorts of drugs might be acting. Now, all of, in all of these cases, um, the, these drugs and molecules are, are coming from natural sources. Um, and uh, we know that mankind has been using these sorts of um, agents through these natural resources over, over thousands of years. It's not, and that's evident from the archeological record. It's not entirely clear what they've been used for, but most likely for recreational purposes and also to support ceremonial and religious uh, uh, cultural events. Now, I should say that all of the drugs here are coming from a natural source, but there are also lots of psychedelics that are available today that are man-made, they're synthetic. And one of these drugs that I'll classify as a, a psychedelic is MDMA, otherwise known as ecstasy. And I'll talk a little bit about ecstasy a little bit later on in the presentation. So the research interest in these drugs pretty much started at the end of the 19th century by work by Hefter, and um, he was a German ph uh, pharmacologist, and he isolated uh, mescaline and, um, and even um, uh, experienced uh, its psychotropic effects by, uh, by administering it to himself. And there's a similar story 40 years later regarding Hoffman and LSD. Hoffman was actually very influential in the, in the field. He was working for Sandoz in Switzerland at the time, and he was able to supply uh, uh, clinical researchers with pure forms of uh, LSD for investigation. And he was also influential because um, he was an advocate, a strong advocate of the idea that these drugs had therapeutic uh, potential. Now, another important research development was by John Gadam in the 1950s. And Gadam was a, a British uh, pharmacologist working in Edinburgh, and he discovered an interaction between LSD and this molecule 5-HT in an isolated tissue preparation. And this discovery was uh, came at a time when it was first recognized that 5-HT was present in the brain. So early ideas began to form of linking 5-HT, the effects of psychedelic drugs, and mental well-being. Now, we'll never know whether animals um, are, are able to experience a psychedelic effect, but um, if you administer LSD and, and such drugs to animals, it does provoke a curious effect. It changes uh, motor behavior and produces uh, a number of um, involuntary and purposeless motor changes, in, uh, including head twitches and rodents. Uh, and, and those sorts of behavioral effects are even used today as a surrogate marker of uh, the hallucinogenic effects of these drugs. And then we come into the 1960s and these drugs became uh, in, uh, in widespread use uh, as an aid to psychotherapy. It started in the 1950s and was encouraged by um, a number of clinicians, including uh, Osman and also uh, Leary, uh, and the sorts of patients uh, that were being uh, um, uh, helped uh, uh, with this therapy included patients with depression, uh, but also patients with substance misuse problems and patients with different forms of anxiety, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, this practice came to a precipitous end in 1970. Uh, the therapeutic use of, 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 of psychedelics uh, in combination with psychotherapy got um, tangled up with the counterculture movement in the 1960s. This was an, an anti-established movement that had a number of features, and one of which included encouragement of the recreational use of uh, psychedelic drugs. 
And various governments around the world, there was a backlash starting in the, in the United States, and they came to the view that these drugs were, in fact, um, of, of limited uh, medicinal use. Uh, they were not safe. Uh, and that they were perverting the minds of the of, of the young. So um, they were uh, banned at that point, starting in the US uh, with the Controlled Substances Act and other, other countries followed in the UK. They, they formulated uh, the Misuse of, of, of Drugs Act. And those uh, legal changes stifled um, uh, research on these drugs, essentially from that time onwards. It didn't stop research. Um, Following up on the discoveries of Gadam, it was eventually discovered in the mid-1980s that there was a particular 5-HT receptor, I'll mention more about this in a moment, that was identified as the psychedelic drug target. And lots uh, is now known about this receptor at a kind of a, a atomic de uh, atomic a level of atomic detail. Uh, and methods were developed to detect these receptors in brain. And it's possible these days to detect this E, uh, receptor, even in living humans, using positron emission tomography. <clears throat> so what was also happening at the beginning of the, of the 2000s was a small number of studies were beginning to be, uh, with cor of courageous uh, clinical researchers, were beginning to carry out small scale clinical trials. They may be able to persuade regulatory authorities to go ahead with these sorts of experiments and began to report that these drugs actually weren't as dangerous as perhaps the public believed them to be. And they were pulling out some interesting psychotropic effects. And those studies combined with this clinical need to treat severely ill patients resulted in a number of uh, reports starting from 2011 onwards of psilocybin being antidepressant in clinical trial. And we've now got to the point that the FDA, this is a US regulatory authority, have awarded breakthrough status to both psilocybin and MDMA. That means that they're on a fast track um, um, towards becoming uh, therapeutic agents. So just take a closer look at the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. Um, and the evidence is pretty good, I think, that psychedelics have antidepressant effects, at least in clinical trial. So these multiple trials that were carried out starting in 2011, as I said, are reporting rapid onset antidepressant effects of psilocybin. There's even a recent retrospective analysis of some of these historical studies that were carried out in the 50s and 60s uh, that have come to the conclusion that psychedelics uh, have an antidepressant effect. And there are numerous registered and ongoing clinical trials, not only of psilocybin, but also LSD uh, and other different types of psychedelics, not only in depression, but also in other types of psychiatric disorders. So I'm just going to take a look at the data coming from one of the clinical trials looking at psilocybin. This is the biggest trial to date. It was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine about 18 months ago. And the lead author here, Goodwin, is Guy Goodwin, who um, was previously a professor of psychiatry in Oxford. So one assumes that this paper's got pretty good provenance here. Here's this data, it's depression score. So a uh, downward deflection in, in the curve here suggests an antidepressant effect, and it's over time, over several weeks. And there were three groups of patients, large numbers of patients, that had given one of three different doses of psilocybin. And I think what you can see from this data quite clearly is within days of administration, there was a rapid onset antidepressant effect. And I should say that all of the patients that were recruited into this trial were treatment resistant. So they had a history of non-response to uh, existing antidepressant treatments. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you will spot that there isn't a placebo group here. And normally in these sorts of trials, it's important to have a placebo group to control for the possibility that, that patients have an expect, uh, expectancy of a successful therapeutic outcome. The authors would argue, well, there appears to be a dose-related effect here, so they think it's a real effect. But I'll come back to the importance of having placebo-controlled blinded patients uh, a little bit later on. So how harmful 
of psychedelic drugs. To illustrate this, I'll look at another paper. This is coming from David Nutt and colleagues that was published in The Lancet a few years ago. And he was looking at the harm associated with the use of recreational drugs. And this includes psychedelics. So here's a harm score. Here's the different uh, types of drugs. I've masked the drugs here because I'm going to challenge you to identify those drugs that are likely to carry the most, the highest level of harm compared to those that have got the least level of harm. And whilst you're placing your bets, I just mentioned that harm in this study was um, uh, assessed in two ways. One is a harm to the users. So that could be uh, HIV infection associated with intravenous drug use, harm to others could be um, uh, injuries in road traffic accidents associated with drunk drivers. So I'll unmask uh, the, the, the data here. And prize goes for those who predicted that alcohol would be, uh, at least in this study, estimated to be most harmful uh, of, of these drugs recreationally, whereas the other end, uh, the least harmful drugs were estimated to be the psychedelic drugs. Now, I should say that probably one explanation for why drugs at this end are the most harmful is because drugs at this end are the ones that have got the highest uh, dependence liability. That is, that these are the drugs at this end are most likely individuals are most likely to get addicted to them. Now, this isn't an advert to go out and uh, ingest a bowl of magic mushrooms. Uh, these drugs uh, are associated with harmful effects. It's just to say from this data, the harmful effects are less than some of these other drugs. Just to briefly mention that this sort of data plays on this misuse of drugs act, which determines the sort of penalty that you get if you're caught in possession or making uh, or supplying uh, these sorts of drugs. And the biggest penalty goes to those individuals who are using drugs in class A. And it was determined at the time that drugs in class A are the ones that are associated with the most harm. And you can see from this data here that um, uh, uh, clearly there's a problem with this act. And uh, there's a lot of pressure coming uh, on government to uh, take another look at this act uh, and change it. So how do psychedelic drugs work? Well, I've mentioned this uh, 5-HT a number of times, and they're acting at the 5-HT synapse. And this is the important element on a 5-HT neuron. So in your brains, you've got around about 100 billion neurons, and about half a million of those neurons off are utilizing 5-HT as a signaling molecule. And this part of the figure here illustrates the different scales at which we can visualize the 5-HT system. So here we got them at, uh, at, the, at the level of the whole brain. We're now zooming in. These, dot, these dots here, we can see single 5-HT uh, containing neurons. Here's an individual neuron. Here are the processes that are coming off this neuron. And at the highest level of, uh, uh, of uh, visualization, we come to the, um, to the terminations of these processes and we're seeing synapses. And here we've got a cartoon of a 5-HT synapse. So the thinking is, if we've got some sort of electrical uh, signal that comes along here, it, it acts as a trigger for the mobilization of 5-HT from these storage sites. The 5-HT released, it acts on these receptors, uh, and this produces a signal that's transmitted to the next neuron. And we also have a 5-HT transport here that sucks up the released 5-HT and re returns it back to the storage sites. And this synapse is thought to be the site of action of psychedelic drugs. And they're interacting with the re receptors and mimicking the effects of 5-HT. This synapse is also the site of action of SSRIs are acting in a slightly different way, and they're blocking this 5-HT transporter. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than this because it turns out that there are there's more than one type of 5-HT receptor, and these drugs are interacting with it one, one of these many different types of receptors. I'll show you this slide here, and I'll show it for two reasons. One is it's sort of give you some sense of the kind of the, 
the complicated and chaotic world that some of us pharmacologists are working in. Um, but it also illustrates, I hope, that it's taken around about 60 years for scientists to recognize that 5-HT had more than one or two receptors, but in fact, it has 14 different types of receptors. And these are classified in an, uh, according to their families, probably one through to seven. And we have a 5-HT2 family here. And all of these receptors, they're coming from different genes, they, they're made of different proteins, they're expect, expressed in different parts of the brain, and indeed they're involved in different functions. And one of these receptors, the so-called 5-HT2A receptor, is the target for psychedelic drugs. And there's lots of evidence that these drugs are interacting with this receptor at the, at the molecular and also at the behavioral level. I'll just show you one bit of evidence that's, uh, that indicates that this receptor is underpinning the psychedelic effects of, 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 of psychedelic drugs. And here, in this case, it's psilocybin. So this is data, it's uh, neuroimaging data coming from a, a, a group in Copenhagen. And what they were doing in this study, they um, were looking in healthy uh, human volunteers and putting them into a PET scanner and the subjects were administered this radio tracer and made it possible to detect these receptors in the brain. And this is under baseline conditions. And these are the same individuals scanned two hours after administration of psilocybin. And this changing color is evidence that the psilocybin, or at least the, the psilocin component of it, is interacting with these uh, receptors and displacing the radio tracer. And they went on to show also in this paper that the intensity of the psychedelic effect, because these subjects were uh, having a psychedelic experience, the psychedelic effect correlated with occupancy at this receptor. In other words, in those individuals who experienced the highest occupancy of the receptor, they had the highest uh, intensity of psychedelic effect. So how are these drugs working to improve mood? And the answer is we don't really know, and they're just a number of theories. And one theory is, well, it's the psychedelic experience itself. So what could be happening is that they're giving individuals a new way of thinking about the world, and that this uh, disrupts these negative ruminations that are a feature of uh, individuals who are suffering from depression. We're still not entirely sure whether this idea is correct. I'll show a little bit of evidence to suggest that, in fact, the psychedelic effect and the antidepressant effect might be separable. Another idea is, well, it's this interaction between the psychedelic experience and psychotherapy taking us back to these events in the 1960s. So it could be that uh, the drugs are, are, are opening up the brain and allowing the psychotherapist to dig deeper into the mind. This idea is still uncertain. And I should say that the, the, the clinical trial that I showed you a moment ago, in fact, didn't include psychotherapy as part of the experimental design. And a final idea is that uh, quite different uh, is that psychedelic drugs are in, uh, inducing neuroplasticity. So there is this popular idea in the depression field that the depressed brain, it's got this psychological and biological rigidity, and this lack of flexibility makes it difficult for individuals to cope with changing circumstances like high levels of stress. And what the drugs are doing is they're increasing plasticity, they're increasing flexibility within the brain. So they might be increasing the number of connections between neurons. They might be increasing growth of neurons or in, even introducing the formation of new neurons, doing this through altering gene expression. And there's quite a bit of evidence that psychedelic drugs are actually increasing plasticity. And if you don't believe me, then you should talk to Aurelia. Now, Aurelia is a DPhil student in the lab. She's a, a student at UNIF. Uh, and when she's not skating for Latvia, you'll find her invariably in a small dark room with a large microscope imaging uh, neurons that she's incubated with psychedelic drugs. And what she's find that after just 60 minutes of incubation, if she carries out careful measurements on these neurons, she finds evidence that they're increasing. Uh, they're, 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 uh, measure, they're increasing in, in size. And she's also got lots of evidence that these drugs are also increasing other markers of plasticity. We're not alone in this regards. There are lots of labs around the world that are reporting that these drugs are increasing plasticity. They're doing it quite quickly. 
and that some of these effects could be enduring, associating, of course, with the, the sorts of clinical data that I showed you a moment ago. So finally, just to wrap up, just take a brief look at uh, the future of, 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 of psychedelic drug therapy. Now, just to say that, uh, of course, the hallucinogenic properties of these drugs makes a uh, them very challenging to use clinically. And there have been some recent reports of psychedelic analogues that are non-hallucinogenic. Now, here are examples of five papers that have been published in some of the highest impact journals reporting drugs that are interacting with this receptor. Uh, they're having evidence of antidepressant activity, but they appear to be non-hallucinogenic. Now, so far, these drugs have not um, uh, developed uh, uh, into clinical trials, but when they get there, we'll begin to get some understanding of how important this psychedelic effect is in the therapeutic effects of these agents. So how is it that these drugs that are acting at the same receptor, but they're non-hallucinogenic? And uh, we don't have a good explanation for that. Not even Aurelia knows this, but what Aurelia is doing is she's digging deep into the biochemistry of this receptor. We know that it's got a number of signaling effects, and one of the ideas is that some of these eff signaling effects are underpinning the antidepressant effect, and some of these signaling changes are underpinning the hallucinogenic effect. And what these non-hallucinogenic drugs is, that they're driving the signaling preferentially down one pathway versus another. So she's been modeling these signaling pathways in cell models and looking at the effects of a range of hallucinogenic and non-hallucinogenic compounds. The, the bottom line in her experiments is, in fact, that she can't find any evidence that these non-hallucinogenic compounds are preferentially pushing the signaling down one pathway or another, but it does look as if they're just not very strong uh, agents at this receptor. So finally, there's a big jump between showing that a drug is effective in a clinical trial to it becoming a prescribed medicine. Um, there are advances in this direction. Psychedelics are kind of getting an increasing legal threshold. Regulatory authorities are reducing uh, the, the control over these agents. And currently, um, uh, psilocybin is um, approved for medicinal use uh, in Australia, specifically in the treatment of treatment-resistant uh, um, uh, depression. And there are individuals out there who have come to the opinion, including David Nutt, that these drugs, they're confident that these drugs are having a, a, a therapeutic effect. And let's just get on and use them and, uh, uh, and sidetrack some, uh, some of the regulatory problems. But there have been a number of uh, sobering developments. So as of this summer, uh, the FDA declined to approve the use of MDMA for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. The reasons why it was declined are still not entirely clear, but one problem seems to be they were concerned that the trials that, were, were, that had been submitted to them uh, were plagued by a placebo effect. And finally, another sobering thought is coming back to ketamine. So ketamine is also a powerful um, psychotropic agent. It has a quite different pharmacology to the psychedelic drugs. Um, but it was demonstrated, has been demonstrated to be effective in clinical trials um, um, and has now been approved uh, prescription in the UK. However, there's a recent hurdle that ketamine has not been recommended um, by NICE for the treatment of uh, resistant depression. The upshot of this is that uh, uh, psychiatrists in the UK can use ketamine to treat a resistant depression, uh, but it's not available on the NHS. So you can go to a clinic in Oxford, for example, and if your wallet's big enough, you can get you can get treatment, um, but it's not available uh, through uh, the usual uh, through the usual means. So currently, there's a lot of pressure on the regulatory authorities to take a new uh, a relook at this. Uh, and one gets the sense that the, um, the movement is going to be in favor of making these sorts of uh, making ketamine available on the NHS, but just within specialized clinical centers. And one gets the sense that this might be uh, the direction of travel for the psychedelics. <laughs>
So that's all that I've got to say. I just wrap up. I was told I ought to give you some, some further reading. So here uh, uh, is a book that came out earlier this year um, that includes a chapter by David Knott on psychedelic drugs. And there's also uh, chapters in here on by myself and others on SSRIs. Uh, this is freely available for those of you who've got access to the Oxford libraries. Um, and you have to wait a little bit longer, but there's a special issue of the British Journal of Pharmacology that's coming out early in the new year, specifically on uh, the therapeutic opportunities coming from psychedelic drugs. And included in that review will be an article on these hallucinogenic and non-hallucinogenic compounds put together by myself and Aurelia. Thank you very much for your attention. Trevor, a huge, huge thank you. That was absolutely um, fascinating. And we've got a number of uh, questions coming in. We've got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to try and uh, put a few of them together, if uh, I may. There are a couple um, which are on uh, the drugs um, themselves. Um, so the, uh, uh, the two questions um, I'll, I'll put to you. Um, why do you think there's been a lack of development of new antidepressant drugs, especially uh, given the side effects? And the second, to what extent does contemporary stigma around psychedelic drug usage inhibit further research into their potential benefits? Uh, so on the first question, I think that's a really good question. I think it's very difficult to do clinical trials in major depression. And one of the problems is, is this placebo effect. And lots of trials have gone ahead and um, unable to um, um, dissociate clinical effects of drugs from the effects of the placebo. And um, so drug companies are putting huge amounts of money into, the, into these clinical trials, and then they're coming up with data that's uninterpretable. So I think that's one of, one of the problems I think another problem has been we simply don't know enough about the biology of mood disorder to really come up with rational treatments. And I think that this has been um, holding back the field. Um, the, the second question, Valerie, forgive me, I, uh, was about the stigma associated with mood disorder. Yes. To what extent does contemporary stigma around psychedelic drug usage inhibit further research into their potential benefits? Um, I, I think that I think that the the the, the problem is is around the authorities and the strict regulations that are around the control of these drugs, and um, so the 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 legal um, the laws that were put into position many years ago are still standing, and that's acting as a, a significant barrier. I think another problem is is that the hurdles that um, drug developers have to get over to get through approval, for example, from the FDA. Um, it's a pretty high hurdle yeah. that you have to do these carefully controlled placebo controlled trials that are costing millions of pounds um, to, to, to fund. Uh, and there's still a, a, a low probability that they're going to be successful. So I think that brings us to what is quite a difficult question from Martin Ewell. Um, uh, how can the onset of unipolar depression and other troubling thoughts be prevented by society? So how can we deal with these even before uh, they become something that we need to use drugs for? Yeah, well, that's a really tough question and it kind of doesn't relate directly to what I've been saying here, but I think that um, what what sort of emerging now what there's a lot of focus of clinical research on the factors that put individuals at risk of getting these um these uh, disabling psychiatric conditions so once you can identify the risk factors you might be able to bring into play preventative strategies i'm not thinking about drugs there but you might be able to for example you know lifestyle changes and and so on that could that could prevent these effects coming about at the moment. So there are a number of risk factors that have sort of been identified, but there's a huge amount of research at the moment to sort of um, uh, help us get a, a clearer picture of those individuals who are most likely to go on to have problems later on in life. Um, 
And this brings me to something in, in one of your very early slides, um, which was um, in relation to different uh, parts of the world. And I was very struck, um, actually, uh, uh, and I wondered if this um, uh, was in relation to sort of culture and reporting, that there were some parts of the world in your slide um, where the incidence of uh, 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 mental health and depression seemed to be extremely low, much lower than other. So very high in Southeast Asia and Western yeah. Pacific, for example. Yeah, I, 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 my understanding of that literature is, is that probably the incidence of, of these psychiatric problems is rather similar across the world and across yeah. cultures. It's simply a question of detection and uh, I think that there is the, the stigma does come into play here because I think that in some cultures, the stigma associated with having a mental health problem is so high that individuals and their families are not prepared to come forward and start looking for treatment. So I think that those numbers are more a reflection of that rather than a reflection of uh, the incidence of, 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 of depression or, uh, around the world. Thank you. Um... Uh, some more questions coming in. Um, so Sarah Matdul asks, how do the uh, psychedelic drugs compare to ECT for treatment of severe depression? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question because in fact, currently uh, one of the, the, the treatment options for patients who are severely depressed and who are not responding to treatment ECT is still seen to be an avenue for some patients. Um, we won't know the answer to this question, uh, actually, until there's a side-by-side -side comparison. And in fact, of the clinical trials that have been carried out so far with psychedelic drugs, there's only one example where they've compared a psychedelic drug with a standard antidepressant. It wasn't ECT, it was actually with an SSRI. And um, in fact, that study uh, suggested that they actually had equal efficacy. Um, but it was a very, very important question that, and uh, we, we, we still don't know the answer to it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just flicking through really quickly to try and get in as many as possible. Um, from Ina Braddock, um, personally, which drug do you think will be the first one approved in more than one country and when? Um, that I think the one at the moment that's the most advanced is psilocybin. I think that that's the one that's pushing pushing the envelope here. I think it's at a very advanced level. Um, there's been one, the, 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 the clinical trial that I showed you is a very large one. There's another one follow-up trial that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, and if that's successful, then I think that it will be put before the FDA. There's a very interesting, just on this point, there's a very interesting issue regarding FDA approval. Um, because one of the reasons why MDMA might have come unstuck might partly because the, the, the clinical trial evidence that was put before that body was not sufficiently convincing. But another problem was that uh, thought to be was that um, the therapy was a combination of drug and psychotherapy. And uh, this is a drug approval authority. And I think they were unable to work out what, whether the effect was mediated by the drug or, 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 the psych, or, or the psychotherapy. So the psilocin trials that are going on at the moment to try and get them through um, with speed are rather uncomplicated and they're not including the psychotherapy element to it. So I think that um, we're quite close. It's difficult to put a timing on it, but of, of all the options that are available, that's the one that's the closest from my perspective. Uh, thank you, Trevor. And a, a question here um, from Timothy Brosnan. Um, how would you suggest that psychiatrists ensure that their patients don't get addicted to the administered uh, psychedelics? Well, um, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I, I, I can't give a I can't, I can't really give a, 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 a clinical opinion on this. But what I can say is, in fact, the evidence that these drugs are addictive is very is very weak, actually. Um, um, so. You know, in in um, this is this this is evident from both individuals who use these drugs recreationally. Of course, like most things, people can develop a habit, but it's much less likely to get develop a habit of using these sorts of drugs compared to something like uh, amphetamine or cocaine or tobacco or alcohol, for example. Um, <clears throat> and there's also really good evidence coming from 
um, laboratory models of uh, uh, dependence liability that in models that would predict uh, dependence li that are able to detect uh, a, a, a dependence liability in drugs, psychedelic drugs show very little evidence of, uh, of, of that problem. Um, and uh, oh, I've lost this question um, uh, from Alina, I think. Um, do you think there is a case um, of combining psychedelic therapeutics with mindfulness-based approaches? Um, uh, you talked about uh, MBCT. Uh, might they have a synergetic effect? Well, I, I think that's a really interesting question, actually. I mean, uh, I just go back to what I was saying about with SSRIs. I mean, the current clinical practice, my understanding is the current clinical practice with SSRIs is that usually they use in combination with counseling. And there is certainly evidence to suggest in the literature that the combination actually has a synergistic effect. At the moment with the psychedelic drugs, um, it's unclear what role the psych psychotherapy plays. Um, and there's, if you look at the literature, there are quite different views about whether the, psych the combination of the two is having an additive effect or not. And I think it will only be when properly controlled trials are carried out, looking at the combination, looking at uh, psychedelics with and without the, the psychotherapy that will really get an answer to that. Uh, Trevor, thank you. We have run out of time. I'm just going to put one last question to you from me, um, because you showed some data that psychedelic uh, drugs will make neurons um, uh, grow. Does this mean that taking these drugs will make us all smarter? <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a really interesting question. Uh, I mean, there's good reason to think that that would be the case. I should say that um, those experimental findings are based on neurons in a culture. There's other findings that has been based on studies coming from mouse, mice and animals. We still don't know whether this is, effect is going on in humans. And in fact, we, uh, that now the pet images do have a, a marker of synapses and I know that there are studies going on to explore exactly this question of whether taking a psychedelic drug could increase the amount of synaptic connectivity in the brain. Just to say that, um, of course, uh, psychedelic drugs, uh, um, they do have effects on cognition. And we do know that artists, musicians uh, and so on have been using these drugs as a source of creativity. Aldous Huxley would be a would be a prime example of that. Now, whether, uh, uh, yeah, whether these drugs are actually making those authors smarter or not, um, uh, there's certainly argument they would argue that it's making them more creative. I mean, I would say that, you know, for students who are listening in on this presentation, um, if you're thinking about kind of taking these drugs to improve, you know, improve your performance exa in exams, uh, I, I would proceed carefully, and I, I, I suggest that rather than turning to psychedelic drugs, it might be better just to turn up at your tutorials. <laughs> Trevor, very good advice. Thank you so much for your time um, and for giving us such a fascinating um, insight into uh, your work. A huge, huge um, thank you. Uh, to those of you um, listening, if by any chance you can join us on the 23rd of November for our London dinner, please do. Trevor, there was a question about whether or not your slides could be shared. Um, um, yes, I've, is, give, I've given a copy to um, uh, the college office and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that to, 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 to happen. Yeah. Well, thank you. To those of you who'd like a copy of the slides, we'll make sure um, that they are available. Uh, Trevor, again, a huge thank you. I certainly learned a huge amount. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you at the next one of these talks, if not at our dinner. Thank you. Thank you.